Hi, recently I made this overview of methods to control electric current and obviously mentioning transistor in such video was a must. Unfortunately, due to the nature of material, it was not possible to tell much about it. Of course, it's such a deep subject that I could make entire series of videos about it. So here I will just outline its most basic possibilities. But then I started thinking, okay, it is a deep subject, but unless you want to build something really complex and highly optimized, probably don't need to know all the science behind it. Same as you don't need to know thermodynamics to drive a car. Ultimately, I came to a conclusion that there are just a few key things that you need to know to unlock most of transistors potential in your project. So if I omit all the theory and things that are irrelevant in simple applications, it should nicely fit a short video like this. Okay, so how this thing works? Well, it depends. There are two main types of transistors, bipolar and unipolar. Bipolar transistors are not something that you will frequently use in DIY, for reasons that I will explain a bit later, so now I will focus on unipolar type. Under this category, we also have several subtypes, which are MOSFETs, either N-channel or P-channel, and IGBTs. Fortunately, IGBTs behave pretty similar to N-channel MOSFETs, so, at least on the basic level, they don't need to be explained separately. It's enough to mention that, generally, N-channel MOSFETs are better choice for low-voltage applications, while IGBTs performs better when you need to control high voltage and high current. So let's see some simple circuits utilizing N-channel MOSFET. For the purpose of demonstration, it will simply be some load, let's say a heater, powered from 12 volts battery. To make the current flow, you need to raise the voltage on transistor's gate above the voltage on its outlet. That's why you usually want to put N-channel transistors on the low side of a load. If you put it on high side, the voltage behind transistor will be zero with transistor closed, but close to 12 volts with transistor open. So to keep the voltage between the gate and outlet on some given level, you would need to use a small transformer or something like that. This is not an unusual design, but in this case, such complication can be easily avoided by just moving transistor into more suitable location. Situation is quite opposite for P-channel MOSFET. To turn it on, you need to lower the voltage on its gate below the voltage on the inlet. So this time, high side of a load is the preferred one. Please note one thing. I've been talking about control voltage, but nothing about control current. That's because unipolar transistors have their gates electrically insulated from other terminals, so opening and closing happens due to changes in electric field, not the flow of current. Of course, junctions have some capacitance, so actually some current is flowing in and out every time you switch transistor state, but for switching frequencies below, let's say, 10 kHz, it's such a minor current that you don't need to bother. Normally you won't need higher frequencies in simple DIY scenarios, so as it's an introductory video, I don't want to dig deeper into high frequency considerations. Just keep in mind that there are some consequences of raising the frequency above certain limits. And if you want to know more, just let me know in the comments. Okay, so a word about this control voltage. As you probably suspect, it can't be just any voltage. As a general rule for all unipolar transistors, it can't go above plus minus 20 volts. So diagram you see is valid right now, but if you would like to use for example 24 volts battery, it would already damage transistor on first attempt to use. So for power supplies above 20 volts, you need a separate voltage source to drive such unipolar transistor. Fortunately, in most cases you won't use physical switch to operate your device. Usually it will be some sort of logic circuit, often containing a microcontroller, and such structures typically operates on voltage levels of 3.3 or 5 volts. 
Such voltage is obviously within safe limits, but is it sufficient? To find out, you need to check your transistor's datasheet. Normally it's pretty easy to google it out. Some shops even have such document available on product page, as it's really essential to figure out what are the actual capabilities of specific model. Straight away you can see what is its rated voltage and current, but if you scroll down a little, you should find a chart similar to this one. It shows how many amps can actually flow through it at specific gate source voltage. As you can see, this specific model may not even start on 2.3 volts. You need more than 4 volts to make any current flow and around 6.5 to get its rated current. But if you check nearly identical model, just one letter difference in signature, now you can count for around 10 amps at 3.3 volts, which is already quite significant value. But there is a catch. As you can imagine, such current will certainly heat the transistor up. Question is, how much? To figure that out, we need to have a look on the chart above. For clarity, let's say our gate source voltage is 4 volts. In such conditions, 10 amps will cause voltage drop across transistor of around 0.5 volts. As you may know already, power equals voltage times amperage, so we can expect around 5 watts of heat to appear due to current flow. Good to know, but why should we care? It becomes clear if you look at thermal characteristics. There you should find junction to ambient parameter. It specifies how much the temperature will raise per watt of heat when transistor works in the open air without additional measures. So we just need to multiply the 5 watts we estimated already by junction to ambient parameter to immediately figure out that it's way too much for the transistor to work continuously under such conditions. So what to do now? The answer is quite simple, you need a heatsink. This specific model comes in TO220 package, so it's already prepared to be equipped with some sort of heatsink by design. It's also very popular, so you shouldn't have any problems to find a heatsink that precisely match your needs. They exist on the market in all shapes and sizes, so to figure out which one will be sufficient in your case, you need to check its thermal resistance or at least estimate it comparing to similar designs if it's not specified. Now we just need to sum up all the thermal resistances along the way. Junction to case, case to sink and sink to ambient. And we have a new value of junction to ambient parameter enhanced with a heatsink we are about to install. Once again, we multiply it by expected power and this time our expected temperature raise looks way better. Even if we use our device in extremely hot environment, like 40 degrees Celsius, junction temperature should still be well below its limits. Of course, you can improve cooling even further by installing a cooling fan. Such active cooling improves power dissipation greatly but, unfortunately, this time there is no easy way to estimate final junction temperature. There are some tools to perform such simulations, but in DIY conditions it's usually faster to just give it a try and see what happens. Ok, but if you want to use multiple transistors within your design, you may ask, is it ok to use one big heatsink for all of them? Generally, such constructions exist, so sometimes it might be a good idea, but you need to be aware of one thing. It may happen that this thermal pad is connected to something internally. Every datasheet contains an information about leads assignment. Sometimes it's on the very beginning, sometimes on the end, but generally this is the place you should refer to in order to figure out how to wire your thing. Here for example, you can clearly see that thermal pad is electrically connected to drain, which by the way is quite typical arrangement, so if you use common heatsink in such circuit, you will interconnect all the drains through it and in this case it's definitely not what you want. In such scenarios, you either need to use an insulation kit or a package with already insulated thermal pad. 
Okay, but let's get back to more basic scenario, because it's time to answer another important question. Does it make any difference if you use N-channel or P-channel option? Actually, it does. First of all, N-channel MOSFETs are usually more performant, cost-effective and versatile considering how many models you can find on the market. So as long as you don't have a good reason to use P-channel, you should opt for N-channel transistors. Additionally, it's not an uncommon scenario where you want to power up your microcontroller board from the same power supply as the power part. In such case, you can control and channel transistor directly from selected pin. But in case of P-channel MOSFET, it's not that easy. You need at least some pull-up resistor and additional small N-channel MOSFET to pull gate voltage down when needed. Of course, it may happen that you will need such driver circuit anyway, also in N-channel option, for example to use higher gate source voltages than your logic level, but if simplicity is your first concern, N-channel will probably be a better choice. There is one more thing I like to mention. It's not related to transistors directly, but it can surprise you badly if you don't know that. In the video mentioned on the beginning, you can see me switching on a fan. It was okay to do it using such circuits, because fans like the one I used are not using just an ordinary DC motor. They have their own built-in drivers to deal with power management. Why is it important? Because DC motors are inductive loads, so if you would try to drive it directly with transistor, a voltage spike caused by switching transistor off will most likely exceed its rated voltage a lot, causing permanent damage. It applies not only to DC motors, but to all kinds of devices containing some sort of coils. That's why on a diagram showing the usage of electromagnetic relay, I included this bypassing diode. It's the easiest way to protect your transistor against voltage spikes produced by inductive loads. Inductors are another wide topic, so I won't explain it in details, as it's well beyond the scope of this video. For now it's enough for you to know that you need some extra precautions when using inductors in your circuit. Great, so now as we covered the most important things, let me tell you a bit about bipolar transistors so that you have a complete picture. In this category there are two types, NPM and PNP. In opposition to unipolar transistors, this time it's not the voltage that makes it conducting, but the current. The more it flows through base, the higher collector current can be. It's a really useful feature in all sorts of analog circuits, but comparing to unipolar transistors, they are pretty slow, require high control currents and their capabilities regarding maximum operating voltage and amperage are limited. So this is definitely not the best suited technology for power applications. On the other hand, building an analog circuit from scratch might be challenging and in most cases pointless. Nowadays, for most analog functions you can imagine, there is already a chip that does it efficiently and reliably. So most probably you won't find many DIY applications where you would really like to use bipolar transistors directly. But it's good to know that such thing exists. Good! I think that's enough regarding introduction, but definitely not my last word on electronics. So hit subscribe button if you like such content and see you on other videos.